I'll be reading from Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And this is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing for the whole sermon. <laughs> Well, I, well, I, I mean, that's how on time that's how they used to do it. Is there still a lot of churches and older churches, and older parts of the world? They don't have chairs, they don't have pews. Everyone comes and they stand. And the ones in authority are the ones who get to sit down. So, not a bad idea. Um, but as, as the youth movement says, I'm never in authority. It'd be, Ryan, you're the guy gets to hold the person up in the chair and carry them around. It's going to be great. Um, good morning. Good to have you here. Uh, just a couple of quick news announcements tonight. We are going to Fond du Lac to serve. Um, as kind of for normal. Also, this weekend we have our lock-in. If you're not signed up for that, please sign up. This is for anyone at grade uh, 6, grade all the way up through high school. Um, sign up sheets back there. We also have, uh, at the end of the month, on the 25th, um, for uh, Easter kids, kids in 6th grade through 12th grade, and their families, uh, a pool party at the Myers house. Um, Betty and Rick Myers, so there's a sign sheet out there for that one as well. Please sign up. For that, again, you know means everything is just sign up, sign up, sign up. That's what I'm all about, is signing up. Um, and all that. And they also will have, on August the 18th, a teacher's meeting, right after service, so at lunch will be right if you are teaching. Uh, Prior to our, our children's Bible classes, but our teaching, fill in teach, do the nursery, Want to teach? Might one day in three years feel like teaching? Sign up. It's a good thing. It's going to be any important stuff are going to be said. So I think about our new policies and procedures and all that kind of stuff. So please sign up for that. As we start today, uh, this isn't going to be a long sermon. Just so you know. Um, and when I say that, I mean it. <laughs> David's going to watch this later, and he's going to be like, oh, that rascal. But the truth's not. I mean, as we talk about, we think about, you know, the last couple of days there have been multiple mass shootings, there have been multiple acts of, of violence. And before, you know, before the inevitable political hoorah starts, we can all just stop and take a moment that someone made in the image of God has been so twisted, so hurt, so corrupted by sin that they would purposefully destroy what others made in the image of God. As we live in this world today, we look around and we, it's kind of hard to see God. It's hard to see God. And we as people, generally speaking, are not that good about stopping and looking for God. We are a people of doers. We like to do stuff, generally speaking. Most of our Bible studies and sermons, and rightly so because we need to be challenged to grow and everything, are about what we do. What can I do for my family or in my job or at home? Or at Walmart, you know, it's about what can I do? How do I live my life here? How do I live my life 
there. How do I get my finances in order over here? It's, it's how we do it. And that's not bad. But too often we get so caught up in what we should do, we forget why we do. The sermon today is titled The Fullness of Christ. Now, I ended the sermon because uh, Betty was going to be on vacation, so I had to get this in like a month ago. So I was like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about back then. I have a mission trip to men, and now I have, I have no idea. Jesus seems like a safe bet to preach on. <laughs> well, though, it's happening as we look at the world, and it's no wonder that why we want to be such doers. Everywhere we look, we see broken people, broken situations, broken families, broken countries, broken anything, you name it, it's broken, it's messed up, there's something wrong. It's hard to see God. Which is why we have to look to Jesus. As Brennan just read for us in Colossians chapter 1, that he is the image of the invisible God. That when we look at Christ, we see God. When we look at Christ, we see God. It's kind of hard to grasp. And it should be. It's a mystery. It's one of those things that you can spend the rest of your life wrestling with, and you should spend the rest of your life wrestling with it. You never really come any closer to the answer. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't wrestle. Because he's the image of the invisible God. That this man, realize that we often, I think, in our songs, we talk about the divinity of Christ. We worship Christ. Good. But we're so far removed from the actual times and places in which we forget that he is also a dude. That's a technical theological term. Dude. But he's a man. As well as being a man. Uh, it's, I, I've been in small groups, classes with me. I've said this before, but it was a, I think in 2012, there was a study done at Harding University, the, great, the greatest church of Christ college ever. Sorry, I love people and free people. I can't say no bison, though, because I have half of them are bison. Um, but, okay, but at Harding, and that's where I went, that's where David went, that's where a lot of people went, not everyone went, but it's a good place. They did a, a survey of students, the students who were raised up in the Church of Christ about Jesus and who he was and everything else. This is uh, one of the professors, uh, Dr. Adair, for those who I know him, uh, was part of his uh, dissertation back then. And he discovered... That 80% of the students who were raised up Church of Christ, where we are right now, did not believe that Jesus Christ was a human being. Yeah. He was God, sure. But was he a man? No. Because it didn't make much sense. To them. And I get it. I get why it's hard. We sing songs of praise to Jesus, and he's a man. But we read these stories in the Gospels about Jesus performing miracles, healing people, raising the dead. And it's easier if, if he's not a man, if he's a man. And we can circle around and go forward, but the real reason is if Jesus is, in addition to being fully God, if he is fully human like you and like me, Means we don't really have much of an excuse <coughs> for living the way we do. If we want to say the, the age old thing, I'm only human, the air is human. And he looks at us, so am I. Whoops. Because in here, as in Colossians, it says, He is the image of the invisible God. In Genesis chapter 1, we as human beings, when God creates mankind, he, male and female, he says, in the image of God, he created them. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that we fail to keep. 
to be the image of God. This is not just a statement that he is God, and by looking at him we see God. It is by the fact that it's by him being a human being who was born, grew up, lived, and died that we see God. Think about it. We know most of us in here bear the title of Christian. We take that name onto ourselves. We say we are a Christ person. You know what you're saying when you say that? I'm a Christian? There are many places in the world that will still get you killed. Throughout history, it's gotten people killed. In ancient, the first century, we talked a lot about the persecution under the Roman Empire. Here's the thing. The Caesars of Rome did not care that they were worshiping a different god. They worshiped gods all the time. Whatever. They didn't get on to the Jews about that. They let the Jews hang out just fine. <laughs> what they cared about was them saying that this man, this person, this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem and grew up in this little podunk town in Nazareth, which one of my New Testament professors was lovingly described as the armpit of the Roman Empire. He had a PhD, so he could say. This guy grew up trained as a carpenter, born in a stable, generally homeless for a lot of his life. This man was God. And this man had more authority than Caesar. This man has more authority than prime ministers and congresses, supreme courts, and presidents. This man, who is God. When we bear the name of Christian, Christ person, we are saying that Jesus has more authority in my life than the President of the United States. He has more authority in my life than anything. I went right for President. That was the highest one I could thought of. Right. Should have escalated that a little more. But that's the thing. He is the most authority in my life. But he is the king. That by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And it's by looking at him, this image of God, this perfect human being, the brokenness of our world becomes all the more clear. To everyone, the shootings of this last weekend are painful and horrid and wrong. But to us as Christians who have reportedly Followers of Christ who come into contact with Him, it should hurt even more so. It should be more painful. Because we more than anyone should realize what has been lost. The damage that has been done. But it's also us with that greater knowledge, that greater grief, comes with much greater responsibility. Something, that, the verse that always strikes me every time I read it is in Ephesians chapter 1. Again, this is after a nice long Paul is as like Paul likes to do, praise God, which is great. But at the end of this chapter 1, he has this very interesting statement. And he put, God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of Him who fills all in all. Did you know that when you walked into this room with this group of people this morning, you've encountered the fullness of Christ who fills everything? With this group of people? Think about it. The fullness of Christ is here. In this room. 
And that's utterly terrifying. It should be. Think about it. Look at us. We're not. I think y'all are pretty great, by the way. Just reference, but uh, at the same time, we're not that great. Yeah, I just look at myself. I'm like, not that great. For people whose lives have been broken, we've all sinned. We've all messed up. We've all hurt people. We've all been hurt by people. We all have relationships and issues that we still have to work through in our lives, that we are still struggling to reconcile, that we are sometimes struggling to fix. We are people that sometimes are filled by hate and fear and anger and everything else you can imagine. Us. But Christ looks at us and says, because we belong to Him, you have the fullness of me within you. And any time as he says that we're two or more gathered, there I am also. That's not an idle, yeah, cool phrase. He means it. Where we as Christians gather together, whether it be in the church building, someone's home, the park, the Walmart. Walmart's always my favorite example because most people go to Walmart at some point in their lives. If you've been to Walmart, you know, people need healing at Walmart. <laughs> it's a great place. But it's true. There he is. That means that it, with us comes the responsibility of the power of Jesus Christ. The power to tell the truth. The power to show love. The power to forgive others. The power to care in a world that doesn't. Whenever we have together, it comes not just the power of Christ, but the responsibility of Christ. And we often, I think, don't recognize it. I don't recognize it all the time. But we recognize that we have that responsibility. We have that power. We have the presence of Christ in our lives. But as we think about Jesus, the fullness of Christ dwells in us. But what does that mean? And that is a question, what does that mean that we will have to wrestle with and work through for the rest of our lives, no matter how long it is, to work through for Jesus? So this week, my challenge to you is to meditate on Christ. And how, how to do that? Well, take what we read this one in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 20. Hopefully you're reading your Bible and praying every day, but on top of that, or if not, this is a good time to start. Read that passage every day, and then try to spend five minutes, I don't know, five minutes is a lot of time, it can be. It can be. Maybe on the on, on when you're driving somewhere. Maybe in the morning, in the evening, whenever you can. And just think about Christ. Think about Christ. Read it over and over again if you have to. Meditate on it. You can also read Philippians chapter two. Another excellent place to go and learn about Him. Because when we talk about doing, and we talk about what we want to do, and how we want to serve, and how we want to show our, the love of God to other people, which is great, we have to remember why we love. Because He first loved us. And we have to remember the greatest commandment to love God with everything we have. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. So meditate on Christ, the fullness of Christ. And let that be a comfort. Christ is with us. And let it be a call to action. That Christ is with us. If you need anything at all, prayer, study, anything. Um, I, think, I think we're down to one elder today, so form a Q line at Dean, take a card. He's here. Uh, or anyone, but any brother or sister in Christ here in the room, pray with you, talk to you.
I invite you now to come and stand and as we sing. Everybody. 